May, millions of full-grown salmon schooled together in the North Pacific to begin their great migration, known to Alaskans as the Salmon Run. Many of these millions find their way to the better-known fishing grounds of southeastern Alaska and British Columbia, but a still greater number travel northward to the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. Of the millions that travel northward each year, one thing is always certain. They never fail to appear first at a group of islands known as the Shumigans, situated near the middle of the Alaska Peninsula. The term millions is not exaggerated. For example, in 1932, the run of salmon that emerged from the deep sea near the Shumigans measured 12 miles wide and continued past a given point for 28 days. It seems strange that these salmon should come first to the Shumigan Islands instead of seeking the more direct way to the Bering Sea through the passages to the westward between the Aleutian Islands. But science offers a reason. At one time, the Alaska Peninsula was a group of islands, and the water passages between them were the shortest routes from the Pacific Ocean to the Bering Sea coastlines. For countless generations, the salmon are believed to have used these short passages. Volcanic eruptions have since filled in these passages, but the salmon have not had time to form a new habit and still persist in following the old instinctive routes. Finding themselves blocked by the solid dry land of the Alaska Peninsula, the salmon now turn westward. A new habit is teaching them to find their way into the Bering Sea through the passages between the Aleutian Islands. When the salmon which have evaded the fishermen finally enter the freshwater streams, the streams in which they were born, then one of the great epic struggles of nature begins. Day after day, week after week, for hundreds and even thousands of miles, they battle their way upstream against swift currents, seeking quiet waters where they may spawn. In the salt water of the ocean, these fish were in the finest of condition. Now in freshwater streams, they stop eating entirely, lose their beautiful silver color, take on brilliant hues of pink, red, and purple, and they are safe from fishermen's nets, for they are totally unfit for human consumption. Some of the streams are so shallow, they travel for days and weeks with their backs out of water. Their particular mission in the economy of creation is to see that their species is perpetuated, even at the cost of their own lives. Next year, their offspring will swim downstream and lose themselves in the ocean. But the adult salmon, now fighting against the swift current, will never return. For as soon as the spawning is done, they die. Self-preservation, proverbially the first law of nature, in this instance becomes the law of the preservation of the species. As they fight their way upstream, a grotesque physical change takes place. A peculiar overshot and underslung jaw with big teeth develops and grows longer day by day. These powerful jaws enable them to dig holes in the gravels and mud at spots in which they choose to lay their eggs. No longer are they able to feed. Their doom is sealed. Battered and worn, they rest occasionally under a river bank or in some quiet eddy before again attacking the rapids and falls and swift current ahead. Not anywhere nor at their own seeming convenience do they stop and spawn. A God-given instinct drives them on and unerringly do they obey. If the salmon deposited their eggs at random on the bottom of the riverbeds where the riverbeds would freeze, the eggs would be destroyed. Ice crystals would pierce them like so many little pins. With the cunning of God-given instinct, they drive onward until they reach a spot such as this, where bubbling springs come up out of the mud and gravel. Instinct has taught them that water coming directly from a spring does not freeze in winter, and here the eggs will be safe. When the eggs are finally laid and cared for, the salmon swim a little distance from the nest and fan the water with their tail fins causing a layer of mud to settle and completely hide the eggs from sight, thus securing them from enemies and serving as an incubator until they hatch out the following spring. Many never live to complete this inspiring work nature has given them. The battle upstream is too much. They die on the way. 
The last act of this great tragedy is when the spawned out salmon lie on the river bank, dying that their species might live. Then bears, seagulls, hawks, foxes, and other carrying eating creatures flock to the scene. For them, the feast of the year, and soon dispose of the spawned out salmon. Seward thought he had bought a land of gold. He had. But it was really these silver millions that made Alaska so valuable to America and the world. Each year, from February to May, hundreds of men leave Pacific Coast ports and soon spread out on the coastlines of Alaska, busily preparing for the salmon run that is to come. For it is during these great runs the salmon are caught by the fishermen. As soon as melting snow and ice permit, salmon traps such as this one are driven at strategic points, at points where the salmon have been most bountiful in previous years. These salmon traps, consisting of a long double row of piles which stretch out from the land and terminate in another group, box-like in arrangement, are the most effective and economical means of catching large numbers of fish at one time. Between the piles, strong nets are fixed. Then a matter of waiting until exciting words flash by radio from the Shumigan Islands, the salmon are ready. The whole country swings into action. All of Alaska becomes salmon conscious, and rightfully, for it means work for over 21,000 men. Fast tenders are dispatched from the canneries to the traps, which become filled suddenly with wriggling silver flashes by the thousand as if by magic. There is nothing to keep these fish from swimming out once they are caught. Only the instinct never to turn back keeps thousands of salmon in the traps. Once the salmon have started to run, the canneries must operate at a terrific pace, 24 hours a day. The fish traps must be emptied of their flashing finny hordes at least once a day to make way for more trapped thousands. This work is known as brailing. When the cannery tender is pulled alongside the trap, a scoop net is lowered into the heart and soon the wriggling mass is transferred to the hold and decks of the tender or accompanying scows. Truly a dramatic sight. These traps catch as many as 35,000 sleek and meaty salmon per day. Trap fishing, of course, is only one of the methods used to catch the millions of salmon. Other fishermen in small, fast seine boats armed with nets sweep the seas where the salmon are known to be moving. The salmon run is short, lasting from the middle of May until the middle of August, and every means is taken to catch as many fish as possible. From the time the salmon are caught to the time when they are canned and cooked, only 24 hours is allowed by law. Many of the salmon canneries allow only 12 hours for these operations to ensure the freshness and quality of their packs. Some salmon traps are as many as 80 miles away from the home cannery. Hence it is a steady race for the captains of the speedy trap tenders and seine boats which transport the fish. Truly there are no more courageous skippers to be found elsewhere on the seven seas. Day and night, at top speed, they plunge through blinding fogs, through storms, sleet and rain, along coastlines which abound with treacherous rocks, reefs, and conditions more unfavorable to safe navigation than in any other place the world over. Imagine yourself for the moment here on the tender Trojan, approaching a typical Aleutian cannery at Falls Pass on Unimac Island. The whistle sends the ever-present seagulls into flurries of screeching excitement. For them, it is a dinner bell announcing the approach of a square meal. All during the season, they flock to the canneries and wait for the cleanings of the fish on which they feed.
Once alongside the fish house dock, the tender crew loses no time in transferring its cargo of freshly caught salmon. For as soon as one tender is unloaded, there is another to take its place. A sane boat fresh from the open seas, or an independent fisherman with his catch. No human hands touch the fish. A mechanical elevator moves them rapidly into the sorting bins in the fish house. Almost human, the iron chink, cuts off the heads and tails, cleans and in some cases molds the fish to fit the cans in a jiffy. From the fish house, the salmon travel in pure, clear spring water to the canning house. As thousands of fish are cleaned and delivered to the canning house, hour after hour, there must be thousands of cans to imprison the delicate flavor for which the Alaska salmon has found universal renown. Ingenious machines, such as this one, have been developed to reform the cans, attach and seal the bottoms, and deliver them in rapid succession to the canning house nearby. the salmon industry was growing in Alaska, can manufacturers found it advantageous to ship partially formed cans to the fisheries. For a time, the cans were made entirely by hand at the canneries, fashioned from sheets of tin, but this method is now little used. Finally, the idea of shipping partly manufactured cans was evolved by the can manufacturers. Millions of these are now shipped to Alaska where they are completed at the canneries. Filling machines are no less a wonder than the iron chink. The salmon are placed on a conveyor at one end, sharp knives cut them into sections, then they disappear into the depths of the machine. When you next see them, they emerge at another opening, the salmon tucked neatly into cans, each can full containing the proper weight and choice cut of fish. There is even a device which rejects cans that are underweight. From the filler, the salmon proceed to another machine known as the clincher moving often at the amazing speed of 140 cans per minute. The clincher puts the tops of the cans in place automatically. Next along the route of travel is the vacuum sealing machine. This receives the cans with clinched covers, sucks all the air out and seals the cans hermetically. To this machine developed by can manufacturers, we owe a great debt for without its benefits and its perfection in sealing cans so that no air can reach the contents, no food could be preserved in this manner. Rolling merrily onward, the cans pass through a washing machine. Then nimble rackers scoop them up and place them on the cooking trays. Huge 
cavern-like steam cookers known as retorts stand ready to receive tray loads of freshly canned salmon. the half, the salmon cook under heavy steam pressure, simmering in their own juice until done to a queen's taste. during the season, the cannery is a beehive of activity. Continuous cleaning, canning, and cooking of many varieties of salmon. In addition to these canneries on land, there are even floating canneries. Ships that are equipped with canning machinery and move from place to place following the fish. Constant inspection eliminates the slightest leak in any can. Cans properly sealed contain no air, and this ensures the continued freshness and purity of the salmon. Usually in 12 short hours, salmon fresh from the sea are sealed fresh in the can and set out to cool. Modern labeling machines make quick work of their task. There are several varieties of salmon and most canneries have a special label for each brand. You may wonder how the labelers can distinguish the various varieties which are canned each day and set out to cool thousands tier upon tier. The answer is simple. The salmon are canned in batches, one variety at a time. As the cans pass through the clinching machine, a special marking for each variety is stamped on the cover of each can and thus these labelers have no trouble in putting the right labels on the right cans. Labeled and boxed, the salmon are now ready for shipment to the markets of the world. Canada, Europe, especially England and the British Empire in general, are Alaska's best customers. And our own country, of course, is the greatest consumer of all. I still find many people who think that Alaska was a useless acquisition. I can merely adduce a few simple facts in answer. Each year, the original purchase price of Alaska has come out of the great 590,000 square miles of territory in its gold output alone. The furs of Alaska have yielded millions. Farming and dairying are now succeeding in the Matanuska Valley. There are almost inexhaustible deposits of coal, oil, sulfur, iron, copper, and other metals and minerals worth millions. Its forests would supply the world indefinitely with pulp. But even if Alaska had none of these tremendous resources and supplies of raw materials, it would have been worth its price merely for the wealth of its adjacent waters. For the salmon industry grosses each year 
In canned salmon alone, several times the original purchase price of the whole territory. Truly, Seward signed for a bargain. Not Seward's folly, but Seward's far-sighted wisdom.